<sighs> Finally, something works. Every large project presents problems that you either didn't anticipate or things turned out differently from your expectation causing other problems. Today I want to share some of my pain points with you so that hopefully you won't experience them the way I did. Let's start with weight. This is a GY6 scooter motor which is what was originally powering this go-kart here. As you can see, I've got it on the scale and my expected weight savings was going to be approximately 100 pounds when I removed it. And it turns out that this guy only weighs a measly 60 pounds. Coupling the fact that the original motor only weighs 60 pounds and these batteries, which I estimated initially before buying them, that they will be about 40 pounds a piece. These guys turned out to be 60 pounds a piece. So if you imagine a 50% increase in weight times four, that is a significant increase in weight overall uh, relative to what I anticipated I would be carrying with me. Because of the weight of these batteries, I can't just put them anywhere. When I initially started thinking about this, I was looking at this basket and saying, hey, you know, there's a, that's a convenient place to put them to keep this passenger space available for my son because I really want my children to be able to ride with me, you know, one at a time. But after seeing how much they weigh, there's just no way I could practically put that much weight up this high. That will create a significant center of gravity problem. Having a center of gravity up too high increases your risk of tipping the cart over when you go around corners. And obviously that's not something that we want. So I wanna get the batteries back down in order to keep the center of gravity down. After kicking this around for quite a long time, trying to decide how I want to manage the batteries and their location, you can see where they ended up. There was a footrest that was right here. I ended up cutting that out with the grinder and that allowed me just enough space to squeeze the batteries into this uh, compartment here. Having the batteries here allows me to get the center of gravity very low down near the level of the tires. And then I can raise up that seat just a little bit and have a platform cover up the batteries. And of course, they'll be strapped down and everything to keep that area secure and protected. Now, there are certainly some alternative options here. Given my situation, the amount of power that I need and the distance I wanna be able to drive, I've decided to go ahead and keep these batteries. These are 100 amp hour deep cycle batteries. Despite their weight, I've decided to go ahead and use them. But there are options like going with a smaller capacity battery, which would be lighter. You could also switch over to lithium and those batteries have a much higher power density. Therefore, you could get smaller batteries that would give you the same capacity. They even can discharge down to a much lower rate. So there are a lot of benefits and that trade-off there is the cost. Uh, some people will even go so far as to build in their own lithium batteries from you know, uh, laptops and things like that. That's not something I wanna do. But if you're interested in that kind of thing, then you could even make your own lithium batteries. So if cost is not a limiting factor for you, I would certainly recommend switching over to lithium for the weight savings and the uh, sheer power density that comes along with it. The next thing I wanna discuss with you is gearing. So with this current setup, which was not my original intent, uh, this would give me a speed of approximately 59 miles an hour because I have 20 inch tires here. This one is 31 teeth, this guy is 10 teeth, and the motor spins somewhere around 3100 RPM. Uh, my original intent was to buy the smallest sprocket I could buy, which I thought was gonna be eight teeth, but it turned out to be 10, and to get one large enough here to give me a final speed of about 25 miles an hour, which seemed a little bit optimistic to me, but I was gonna try it anyway. Going back to the problem, so this guy has 31 teeth and I was looking for something with, you know, maybe more like 70 teeth. I don't remember what I was look what the number was, but the problem is it won't actually fit here. As you can see, there's a cross member of a tubing there. I didn't want to cut that as an important structural member. So I have limited space to get a bigger sprocket. So to resolve this problem, I decided to add a jack shaft. A jack shaft is basically a secondary shaft which allows you to add more gears or sprockets in this case and get more speed reduction. So I'm going to take a chain from my motor down to the jack shaft, which will be this guy. This is a one inch keyed shaft that I purchased online and uh, my patrons helped me out with that, actually with several parts of this project. 
and I will mount this just like this. At first I was thinking about using pillow block bearings that would just bolt up through here. But then I remembered that one of my neighbors sent me several of these flanged bearings like this and I couldn't resist the urge to use them. So I'm actually gonna weld on a piece of flat bar here and there with a hole in it and then mount these flange bearings to that. These are one inch bearings and they're pretty heavy duty. And so this would do the job just fine. I'll put those flange bearings on there and uh, set up my secondary sprockets when they come in. They haven't arrived yet. So hopefully you'll see that in a later build video. You might be curious about this motor mount. Um, as you can see, it pivots from the same place that the original motor did. Uh, I added this spacer and I designed this motor mount and then had it bent at a fabrication shop. So that's why it looks the way it does. I do plan to weld this guy up. A friend of mine let me borrow his welder. So I will weld this up and close that gap and paint it. The next issue would be speed control. As you can see there, I've got a, a potentiometer foot throttle, which is what I'm using to control the speed. And I got a corresponding speed controller to work with it. That was when I purchased this. Now, I also bought this guy. Uh, I bought this on a used listing online, uh, this controller and that motor together. I didn't expect this. I wasn't sure if this controller could work, but I decided I would take it home anyway. And then after wiring it at the workbench, I couldn't get it to work. So I just put it to the side. I didn't want to throw it away just yet. I went ahead and ordered this because I want that way I could be sure that I had the right amp rating. I had the right voltage. And so that's what I did. I bought this Curtis speed controller, uh, 60 to 72 volts. Uh, according to the documentation, it will work as low as 48 volts, you know, and then up to 72. And it has an appropriate current rating and everything for my motor and even a, a larger motor, which I went ahead and purchased, but it hasn't arrived yet. With that being said, I have tried everything I could to get that thing to work and it just would not respond. At one time it kicked on and it gave me hope for just a minute and then it just quit. So I'm actually packing that up and sending it back. The new one doesn't work, but in just sheer desperation, I decided to try this thing again. And what do you know, it works. I just had it wired wrong. So I managed to get this one to work, but what's scary about this is I have no idea what its rating is, except that it was with this motor. So I can assume from that, that it should be rated for at least 60 amps, which is what this motor's rated for at full load. And hopefully that'll get me by for a while. But I really wanted to be able to test this whole system at 60 volts. And I have a larger motor, which uh, I'm concerned this speed controller may not be able to handle. So eventually I'm gonna have to get another speed controller. But at least for now, I've got a forward and reverse, and I got a speed controller that will power uh, this current motor here. One other thing to consider when looking at controllers is brushed DC controllers versus brushless DC controllers. They are different and you don't wanna get the wrong one. And that's also different from a controller designed to operate an induction motor, which would be a much more advanced system, something like what you see in the Tesla car. Uh, those tend to be very expensive uh, systems and you see those in electric vehicles. But uh, at this level, uh, for a go-kart application, the uh, market for this voltage range is generally going to be uh, in the 24 to 60 volt range, and then you're going to have brushed or brushless DC motors. Again, there are many other options, but uh, just trying to narrow the scope for you to the ones that I think best fit this application. Just be sure that whatever controller you get, it matches the voltage of your motor and the current that your motor is going to draw when the rotor is locked, like the maximum possible current that that motor can draw as you might damage your controller if you don't do that. Uh, in my case, this guy was damaged out of the box. It was never actually under load. I was trying to wire it with the whole thing lifted off the ground. And so there was actually never any load on the motor. The highest current I've drawn so far was about 15 amps peak right at startup. And then it went down to just three or four amps while the wheels were free spinning. One other thing I wanna show you is what I did to crimp the lugs on this two gauge wire. So basically I took these, stuck them in my vise here and let the little lip rest on the edge of the vise as I closed it. 
and then holding the wire in the top of one hand, I twist it until it was snug, and then using both hands, I will crimp uh, the end of it on there. After I took it off, I could put it here and hit it one more time with a hammer and it would be really solid on there. Um, the issue I ran into though, is my vise actually broke. Now, this is one of those cheap vices from Harbor Freight and it might just be a quality of material issue. Um, I don't think that crimping aluminum in a vise should be a problem. If you're using a cheetah bar or something like that to give yourself a lot more leverage, then you just broke your vise. But I was pushing this with manpower, so uh, I just leave it up to you to determine whether it was a broken vise or a poor method. You guys can tell me about that. But it seemed to work great for a while until this guy broke. There are a couple of other items that I bought purely for data collection and for this whole video recording experience. And this will allow me to give you guys more information. So you may or may not need these items in your project, but I'll show them to you anyway. Uh, here we have a clamp on meter. I purchased that on Amazon. And here's another meter that's gonna be in line with my motor. And this will be measuring the current, uh, the power output, all of that data and the amp hour especially. And so I think that's gonna be good long term that when I'm riding, I can see the amp hours used and I'll know approximately how much capacity I have left in my batteries. So that'll be one of the last things that I install once I get everything wired and worked out in the place I want it. Uh, this is a RPM gauge. It's basically got like a Hall effect sensor on one end, you attach a magnet somewhere on one of the spinning components and you'll get RPM displayed on the screen. You could show RPM like this, which is what I wanna show, but you could also do, they also have devices like this that show it in miles per hour. You just have to enter a little conversion that tells them how big your wheels are or whatever to do the math for you. Now, there are lots of ways to approach that. Uh, if you are savvy with the Arduino, you could have something as simple as in a Hall effect sensor, some magnets, your Arduino, and then you can get RPM that way. Of course, your Arduino can also do the math and give you miles per hour. So there are lots of ways to display the speed and uh, I'll let you guys decide what you wanna do with that. I also plan to hook my cell phone up. So I bought a cell phone mount so that I can see the uh, GPS and give me miles per hour on the screen. Uh, it won't be quite as accurate as measuring the speed directly, but it will give me a good sense of uh, what the speed is as I drive around. I want to take a second to thank my patrons for supporting projects like this. Being able to purchase miscellaneous items like this makes it so much easier to not just hypothesize and tell you what I think is true, but to measure it and show you that it's true. So I'm really excited about that and, and thank you. If I've made any technical errors in this video, I will certainly add notes to the description. So be sure to check that out. I am so excited about getting this project to the next level. And I look forward to recording the next stage when the rest of my parts get here. Thanks for watching.